All right, so this is the issue. By way of affidavit, because remember, according to the 10 maxims of law, the only thing in which that you can utilize to express your truth is in the form of an affidavit. So it states, truth must be expressed in the form of an affidavit. This is one of the 10 maxims of law. So your truth is expressed in form of an affidavit, which is your nationality document, which states that you are a natural person, i.e. indigenous, state also you are a Moor, which is land, which both makes you signatories, as we see here, and no longer property of the United States, because we know that property cannot own property. So property, for example, is the fact that you're still paying taxes on your automobile, you're still paying taxes on your land, you're still paying taxes on your home. All of these things shows that you are still property, no more different than uh, the real estate, the house and land in which that you own or the car in which that you allegedly own. If it was really yours, you wouldn't have to continue paying taxes for it. So, property cannot own property. So as long as we're in our slave capacity, name in all caps, birth name, which is on the New York Stock Exchange, which has been purchased by foreign corporations, for hundreds of millions of dollars and the largest debt holder is China for the United States. So it says today on the public side, all obligations are in fact U.S. obligations. That's the public side. So you stating that you are a natural person, which is indigenous, you stating that you are a more land, put you also on the private side. Even on the social security card, the front of the social security card is the public side. The back of the social security card, which is tied to the 12 banks, is the private side. So what we do with the birth certificate is as Prophet Nubadrali instructed us to, was to simply not to change anything on the birth certificate per se. So what we did instead was to claim and lien the birth certificate by way of a title of beneficial ownership or title of ownership, birth certificate ownership. All right, along with your authentication of the birth certificate at the local, state, or and or federal level in which that you now can write an executor or executrice letter in which that states specifically in the letter that you are now come back into control of your seat of office. Now you are the president, CEO of your corpse, your corporation, corpse as in your dead body. Hence the reason why we're civilists more tooth in the eyes of the law. We're dead in the eyes of the law, according to the definition of civilist mortus, having no civil rights. This is why Dr. Martin Luther the King was fighting for civil rights. But he was still in the capacity as property cannot own property. 
he was still in the capacity of Negro, Black, and Colored. When he realized this, he told Harry Belafonte that it is seem as if we're breaking our people into a burning building. Yes, you are. Because you did not correct their status and bestow them a nationality before fighting for civil rights. You are still in capacity as civilist mortals. There's no way around it unless you declare your nationality and status correction. And that is by way of an affidavit. Truth must be expressed. Your truth must be expressed in the form of an affidavit. And not just expressed in the form of an affidavit, but put on the public record to make it effective. So that anyone who violates that affidavit, your truth, can be prosecuted. One is kept in their courts and one is kept in our courts. To demonstrate that we are part and parcel. Because when they are really saying that we're not citizens of the United States, we're not federal citizens of the United States. In fact, that court case by Dred Scott was fought over so much to it created what is called the Civil War. Bless you. Blissfulness, I should say. All right, so that shows us that that case was extremely um, can be extremely beneficial or extremely detrimental, depending on the way which you look at it. My good lawyer friend, uh, who actually knew my wife ever since she was four years old, they took uh, karate together. Uh, Mr. Matthews, um, he's been my friend now for about 20 years, and uh, Queen's friend for a show 40. And he became a lawyer and been practicing law now for over 50 years. And he said that he had a friend who looked at the dress guy case as detrimental. You telling me that we never, that I'm never going to be equal to? Yes. You're never going to be equal to the Albion because in the dress guy case, it says there's nothing in which that a white man, that a, um, Black man has that a white man is bound to respect. So, of course, if you're thinking in a Negro capacity, that is detrimental. And which that it was so detrimental to his psyche that it caused him to go crazy. And this man was very intelligent. He was a lawyer, a JD. Huh? He spoke several languages. And Mr. Matthew said that he seen him writing all these different languages all jumbled up together, showing that he had a breakdown. But yeah, you would break down if you did not know that there was a way out, an escape through the loophole, through the matrix. The Moors who showed us how to do this are specifically two groups of Moors. And one group studied under the first group, and that came by way of CM Bay, Charles Mosley Bay, of the Clock of Destiny, Great Seal National Association of Moorish Affairs, in which that our Empress, Verdiasi Guest Turner, a guest on Turner L. Bay, she was an associate, a student of the teachings of CM Bay. So they learned how to put information on the public record. This is why we still continue to do this to this day.
sending them our truth expressed in the form of an affidavit. Because an affidavit in a court of law can't be judged upon. It can't be ruled upon, I should say, by a judge. A judge can't say, oh, we don't have to listen to this. This isn't true, blah, blah, blah. He can't do that. He can say that he can deny a motion, but he can't deny an affidavit. He can't deny a notice, but he can deny a motion. So if you write a paper in which that has the word at top of it, stating such motion, it can be denied. I've seen it done. Morse who was trying to um, put the information together and they put the word motion in this sentence at the top and the judge looked at it and said, it's denied. <laughs> but sending in a notice of special or restricted appearance can't be denied because there's a notice. Judge can't deny a notice. He can't deny an affidavit. Send in an affidavit of declaration of nationality, declaration of, of um, status correction. He can't deny those because that is your truth expressed in the form of an affidavit. So basically what we're saying is that you must identify yourself as indigenous. You must identify yourself as a natural person. You must identify yourself as a Moor i.e. land, in order to be a signator. And once you have that ability to be a signator, then you can go about learning the science of land grants, land patents, allodial title, Bureau of Land Management, which is all under the Department of Interior. All right, so that's what we want to go at um, today. All right. Here it is. The United States citizen, citizen of the District of Columbia, because that's what a United States citizen is, residing in one of the states of the Union or classified as property and franchises of the federal government as an individual entity. This is from the court case, Willing Steel Corpse versus Fox, 298 United States, 19380 LED, 114356, SCT.773. Uh, but as we see here, that part, where it says United States citizens are classified as property. So Judge Tanny actually gave us a loophole that we can utilize to this very day in the Dred Scott case. Once again, we've seen the detrimental side of it, but let's now see the beneficial side of it. So the fact is that we're not U.S. citizens, meaning that we could never have been federalized 14th Amendment citizens to begin with. That's a plus. Even though the 14th Amendment was never fully ratified, according to historical data, which I've shown in this class many times. But the fact is that we're not U.S. citizens with a small c, which is property, shows that we can declare that we are one of the states of the Union citizens, capital C, which before 1871, we was able to do so, in which that Judge Curtis stated, after the ruling of Judge Tanney in the Dred Scott case decision, Judge Curtis stated that Judge Tanney was incorrect in his opinion, and that Free Moors were citizens, capital C, in over in at least five states 
of the union. But we was not U.S. citizens, small case C. We were Union State citizens, capital C. Okay. Here it is, Supreme Court decision was written by Chief Justice Roger B. Taney. Dred Scott was indirectly overruled in the slaughterhouse cases. Technically, it wasn't, which noted that Dred Scott's holding was superseded by the passage of the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution in 1865, which abolished slavery. And if that was the case, then Dred Scott, who was allegedly a former slave, would not have to have gone to court if that really was the case of it being superseded. And the 14th Amendment in 1868, which guaranteed full rights and citizenship regardless of race, which actually it didn't, because the 14th Amendment was never fully ratified. Thus, it is sometimes said that Dred Scott was never officially overruled. The Dred, the um, slaughterhouse cases, in fact, explicitly overruled it. It did? Well, let's see. The first observation that we have to make on this clause is that it put at rest both the questions which were stated to have been the subject of differences of opinion. It declares that persons must be citizens of the United States without regard to their citizenship of a particular state. And it overruled the Dred Scott case decision by making all persons born within the United States and subject of its jurisdiction citizens of the United States. Actually, it did it because one is de facto government, one is de jure government. All right, unconstitutional legislation, which it was, compared to constitutional legislation, which was by way of the four constitutions. The first being the Articles of Association, second being the Declaration of uh, Declaration, or as called the Declaration of Independence, the third being the Articles of Confederation, and the fourth being the Constitution for the United States of America. Private entities, barristers, pretending to possess judicial authority, when really only Article Three judges authorize lawfully according to the Constitution. You have the Bill of Attainers, which actually violates the due process under the law. This is why they change it from saying innocent, not uh, guilty. Are you innocent or guilty? No, they changed it to what? Guilty. Guilty until proven innocent. Right. So, Innocent until proven guilty was what he used to be, but now is guilty until proven innocent. So they have switched it around. That only happens in the de facto government. Federal Reserve notes counterfeit IOUs compared to lawful money, Article 1, Section 10, which is, of course, with um, coinage. And that coinage, uh, and any paper in which that is printed is backed by the coinage. Gold, silver, copper, et cetera, et cetera. These counterfeit notes, as we call it, fiat notes, have no backage whatsoever. Seats of government sold to the highest bidder or briber. This is what we just seen in this past election. Representative government. We know that lobbyists, lobbyists, they can go in and say, look, we'll give you such and such money for your vote if you vote for such and such. Monsanto is damn near running the government. There's many high seats for those who are with Monsanto that are in office as representatives, senators, High positions, feudal law, as compared to our law. Feudal law is what we have right now. 
where you have to pay taxes on your car, your home, your land, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A lodial title, a lodial law, however, is not on the tax administration role. In other words, you do not receive a letter every year to say that you need to pay taxes on your land with our lodial law, our lodial title. You have the Libra codes. You have the Bill of Rights. If you don't know what the Libra codes are, go and do your research. Adhesive contracts meaning that there's no notary. A notary must see both parties or have knowledge of both parties. Adhesive contracts and do not. One person can sign or have an holograph. An holograph is meaning that it's a signature from someone else which you don't even know. For example, driver's license. The commissioner of the DMV signature is at the bottom of it or somewhere on the driver's license. But yet you have never met that person, nor have you voted. Because guess what? The commissioner of the DMV is not a voting position. You can't vote him in or out, or her in or out. It's an adhesive contract as compared to an honorable contract, which is signed by a notary, and you and the other individual is there in front of the notary, and the notary verifies that uh, both of you are agreeable or disagreeable to the events in which that is taking place. or clerk, deputy, etc. And then you have fake prima facie evidence, which they're always thrown up in court. For example, uh, illustration, uh, many years ago, we was in Lee County, and my wife stood up. We had a court case. My wife stood up, and it was a very good lawyer, and she was actually understandable to the Moors. She knew the information. She agreed that this was right and exact. And my wife stomped her because we still had to go before the judge, even though we still agreed. Uh, or she, you know, still paid respects to my wife for her knowledge and information. So what she did was... My wife stood up and said, um, uh, uh, the police officer was on the stand and said, um, is that, is it on? I don't know what you're saying. You was going in and out. No, it was, it was breaking. Yeah. Yeah. You're breaking up on your phone. Um, so my wife um, asked a question. Um, was anyone else there um, that night in question, officer? And he said, uh, anyone in this courtroom was there besides for us, um, officer? And he said, no, no, no one else was there but you and I. And so my wife said, well, um, um, thank you. Um, your, um, officer, this is all I have to um, ask for now. Um, your Honor, based on the information given and the testimony given by the officer, uh, we go to the rules of evidence, and it states that according to the rules of evidence, it must be eyewitness account. That means that anything of which that the, uh, the district attorney will say would be inadmissible in the court of law because it would be hearsay. Uh, she sat down and she said, damn, that was a good one. And she looked at her friend and they just sat down. And the judge said, what in the hell? Get in there. You fight. You fight. You just don't sit down. You fight. (laughs) 
but the case was over. What was you going to fight? And so she stood up again, and she said, um, um, Your Honor, uh, in all best intentions, in order to recruit myself from any um, further prosecution or lawsuits, um, uh, I dis my case, um, dis dismiss myself from this case of um, Miss Tupac, um, Miss um, Kadera uh, Mayat Tupac L. Bay um, court case, blah, blah, blah. And she sat down. So the next time they came up there in order to get verification of that dismissal, we found out that she was no longer working there. And her friends probably was upset at us. My wife said her, uh, they was upset at us. <laughs> but that goes to show you that you can beat them with their own information quite easily. Everything is right there, even if it's at the statue, codes, rules, regulations, ordinances, policies, whatever the case is. Even if it's not constitutional law, you can still beat them with enough information, especially that's coded within the um, general uh, statutes. All right? Even in their own general statutes. All right, they might call it uh, a car, or and in fact, they'll call it a motor vehicle. But if you're not looking for the right terminology, for example, a motor conveyance, <laughs> if you look for motor conveyance, then that's different. For a motor conveyance, you do not need a driver's license. And your car or automobile can be seen as such. Because your car or automobile is not a motor vehicle, which is only for the usage of making money, utilizing the highways and the byways and the waterways, etc. In other words, if you're not an 18-wheeler, if you're not a taxi cab driver, or any one of those that is making money on the highways, then you are not in a motor vehicle. You are in a, you are in a motor conveyance. <laughs> and according to the statutes of the many states in the union, motor conveyance can be a tractor. And if you notice, you don't need driver's license for a tractor, do you? You can jump your tractor right onto the highway and go up and down the road going five miles an hour if you want to. The sheriff would just simply pass you. The police would simply pass you. No one will check for your license because a license is not necessary. So see, even in their own codes, well, statutes in this case, you can beat them at their own game. There is no statute in which that states that you must have your motor conveyance registered. There is no um, forced insurance according to the statutes. So you can beat them at their own game. It simply comes by way of research. So this is the fake prima facie evidence as compared to real actual information in law, not legalities, not legalese. You have the color of law. It appears to be real, but isn't. That's basically fake and prima facie evidence. Color of law is that. So this is what we just talked about. Anyone who knows color of law, for example, we just gave the illustration of the cars, automobiles, slash motor vehicle. Well, you riding, you 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 
have a motor vehicle. Well, that appears to be the case according to color of law. However, constitutional law states specifically, if you go to the Articles of Confederation, that you have the right to travel to and fro in any contraption or conveyance or that you choose to. It doesn't state that it has to be a motor vehicle. Because you know that during those times it was horse and buggy. Then you have cross jurisdiction violations. And this is what we see. The action of the police, he's acting as as they say, judge, jury, and prosecutioner all at one time when he gives you a suit, which is a ticket. The ticket is a lawsuit. He's suing you and to bring you to court. Oh, I stopped because you didn't have your driver's seat on, your um, driver's belt, um, seat belt on. Huh? All right. I mean, if I'm in my private conveyance, then I don't have to put my seatbelt on unless I so choose to. But in 1985, they began to put this nonsense out. In 1985, they put out. This is when the laws changed in the so-called United States that police specifically can stop you for not having a seatbelt on. And that became part of a way in order to gouge you for monies to help help the municipalities to continue operating. It was a way in order to mark up their arrests, stops of individuals, citizens. Then you have separation of powers. We have what the legislative branch, the judicial branch, and the executive branch. The police is acting as if he's part of all three branches when there's supposed to be a separation. Instead, there's a judicial violation. The judicial violation, and this is the reason why in court, at any time during a court case, beforehand, during, or after, you can bring up the judicial issue. All right, without a nationality, you mean nothing. Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 15. Everyone has the right to a nationality. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality, nor denied the right to change his nationality. Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, Article 6. Indigenous people have the right to lands, territories, resources, which they have traditionally owned, occupied, and otherwise used or acquired. So how is that going to be the case? We know that truth must be expressed in the form of an affidavit. So that means that it must be some papers, documents in which that must go to the proper authorities concerning lands, territories, and the resources, which were traditionally owned, occupied, or otherwise used or acquired. And it says states shall give legal recognition and protection to these lands, territories, and resources. So the Empress was able to get return 68,883 acres of land, which mostly was the middle portion to the upper portion of the whole of Louisiana. And she did that by way of showing where these acres of lands was owned by the Turnica family. 
Henry Turner versus the United States was the court case, and the heirs of Henry Turner versus the United States was another court case. And so this is why they need for you to be black and proud. Black, proud, and stateless. Black, proud, and landless. <laughs> this is why. All right? This is why. So right here. Dress got born about 1799, died September 17, 1858. Dress got subject of the decision of the Supreme Court of the United States in 1857, which denied citizenship to the Negro. Void the Missouri Compass Act became one of the events that resulted in the Civil War. All right, that's what became one of the acts. So it says here, Dress Scott Case versus Sanford, 60 U.S. 393-1856. A free Negro of the African race whose ancestors were brought to this country, and that's the key thing, that was brought to this country. Not all of us were brought here. As we have now found out, and now going back and found, you know, done our research um, in our family lineage, and sold as slaves, not a, a citizen within the meaning of the Constitution of the United States. When the Constitution was adopted, they were not regarded in any of these states as members of the community, and this is not true. Judge Curtis said at least in five they were which constituted a state and were not numbered among its people or citizens. Consequently, the special rights and immunities guarantees the citizen do not apply to them. So, right here, the case in which the United States Supreme Court held the descendants of Africans who were not, who were imported into this country and sold as slaves were not included nor intended to be included under the word citizens, as you see, capital C. There's a difference between capital C and, and, and lowercase c in the Constitution, whether emancipated or not, and remain without rights and privileges except such as those which the government might grant them. And so we'll still see that those who are under Negro, Black, and Colored are still being granted legal privileges because they're not rights. You can't be granted a right. Rights come by way of you being a human being upon planet Earth. Come from God, come from nature, Mother Nature, Mother Nature, Mayat, Ra, Nature, Mut, Ra, Nature, does not come from an Albion, a European. He can't grant you rights. She can't grant you rights in no legal, lawful capacity. Rights are born, native given. Privileges, on the other hand, are not. Privileges can be granted to you. For example, the granted privilege of voting. Every 25 years, you have the right, or is it? As we said, it's not. All right? Every 25 years, they have to vote for your ability to have the privilege to vote. It started with Linda Bain Johnson in the 1960s, 1965, then in 19. 85, um, 84, excuse me, Ronald Wilson Reagan had to sign the vote and right bill. And it's a bill. It's an act. What happens when you get bills every month? Bills have to be paid back. Yeah. 
is why the so-called Indians always mentioned that the Albions were in, were the Indian givers. <clears throat> they try to switch it around. The Albion givers, because they can, they try to grant you something and then take it back. Then in 2007, George W. Bush Jr. or George Bush Jr. had to resign it. So every 25 years, the voting right bill, and it's not a right, but it is a bill, or it is an act, has to be signed. So here it is. It says, persons of African descent cannot be, nor were ever intended to be, citizens of the United States Constitution. Plaintiff is without standing to file a suit. So, if you go to court and you mention the fact that they're saying that you are a U.S. citizen, and they say they have jurisdiction, then you ask them specifically about, well, the dress Scott case states differently. It states that I can't be a citizen, nor will I ever be. Now, Your Honor, if you can tell me, please, when was that change? Then I relent my jurisdictional issue. But until you can prove to me that it's been changed or nullified, then I'm not a citizen of the United States. And we have a situation here in which that must be corrected. Right here, Black's Law Dictionary, second edition. Citizen. All natives are not citizens of the United States. The descendants of the Aborigines, uh oh, I thought we are the Aborigines. And those of African origin are not entitled to the rights of citizens. Mm. That constitution does not authorize any but white persons to become citizens of the United States, and it must therefore be presumed that no one is a citizen who is not white. Therefore, there is a marked difference between citizenship and heritage. Mm. Interesting. So this is why Moors are now putting on the SF-181 ethnicity race form white and American Indian. Those are the two closest, or you can simply write in, type in rather, more, and then put the code there, 667, which comes from uh, the CDC, as well as also from um, the federal codes. But remember, you have free white person, according to the Naturalization Act, and you had white person. Both of these are in the Blast Law Dictionary. White person includes Caucasian. Free white person does not include Caucasian. You get it? And in fact, in the definition of free white person, it gives the definition that those of Spain, Portugal, uh, upper portion of Africa are also included as being non-white. I mean, excuse me, of being um, classified as free whites. So let's clear up the confusion of many of those claiming Moorish heritage. Moorish American is an American national, non-citizen U.S. national and not a U.S. citizen of the America's citizen with a lowercase c, small letter c, or U.S. citizen, federalized citizen, which is the 14th Amendment citizen. Understand the difference. You are either part and parcel of the state citizenship, which Judge Benjamin R. Curtis stated that we were already part of five states before the Dred Scott case decision of 1857. 
or a U.S. citizen, small letter C, second class citizenship. We were never, um, we were never fully ratified to be citizens or rather corporate employees or subjects of the U.S. corporation, i.e. second class citizens via the 14th Amendment. Two different jurisdictions. One is a natural person and the other is an artificial person. This is the Wizard of Oz shit that they have put us in. So, Dorothy's, we have to get ourselves out there and click them heels three times and get our ass back to natural person status, indigenous status, not artificial corpse, corporation status. Even Abraham Lincoln spoke on Curtis, Judge Curtis. This is what he says. Abraham Lincoln was among those who identified with the principles announced in Curtis' powerful dissent. Dissent, in his speech of Springfield, Illinois, later that year, Lincoln noted, "Justice Curtis, in his dissenting um, opinion, shows that in five of the then thirteen states, to wit, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, and North Carolina, free Negroes were voting." and in proportion to their number, had the small part in making the Constitution that the whites had. He showed that with so much participation, um, particularity as to leave, no doubt at his truth, as a sort of conclusion of this point, holds the following language. The Constitution was ordained and established by the people of the United States through this action in every state of these persons who are qualified by the laws to act thereon in behalf of themselves and all citizens of the state. In some of the states, as we have seen, colored persons were among those qualified by law to act on the subject. These colored persons were not only included in the body of the people of the United States by whom the Constitution was ordained and established, but in at least five of the states that had the power to act and doubtless did act by their suffrage upon the question of his adoption. So, this has been proven by Abraham Lincoln. This has been proven by Justice Curtis that we were already as we would state, non-citizen U.S. nationals. We was already nationals, American nationals, what we would call state citizens, capital C, as compared to United States citizen, lowercase c, federalized citizen, which is 14th Amendment. So here, I wrote October the 9th, this past year, like I said, we're not citizens of the United States. According to the legal research undertaken by attorney William D. Graves, as written in the Journal of Christian Reconstruction, Volume 13, Number 2, 1994, the required 28 states, three-fourths majority ratification was never completed. This is talking about the 14th Amendment. As proof, Graves stated by March 1867, only 17 of 37 states, or 11 short of the required three-fourths 28, had ratified the 14th Amendment. Under duress, at least six southern states attempted ratification, and their numbers was added to the 22 northern states and Tennessee, presumably making the number of ratifying states 29, or one more than required. However, both Ohio and New Jersey had rescinded previous ratification but were nevertheless counted among the 29 states by the United States Secretary of State. Fraud. Therefore, only 27 states had legally ratified the 14th Amendment, one state short of the required majority required by the Constitution for the United States of America. The unlawful, fraudulent 14th Amendment attempted to make a de facto United States federal black citizen irrespective of the state republics of the Union and in total opposition to international law and in total violation of human rights. This new United States federal citizen 
is displayed with a small lowercase c, which means a diminishing capacity at law. In other words, minorities. If you look up minorities, you will see that it says immature, infantile. <laughs> These are just some of the words in which that goes into the definition of the word minority. Can operate on its own fruition. At the forming of the Constitution of the United States of America in 1889, 1789, ratified 1790, 91, the only de jure citizen, capital C that is, that was recognized was the state citizen. And that was only up until 1871, until after the Civil War, when Congress, which is actually the Congress of Assembly, was never reconvened and Congress just came into existence de facto. Within one of the state republics, citizens with a capital C, which means constitutionally recognized. So see, Dred Scott was seen as lowercase c. He was not constitutionally recognized, and therefore, no Negro who claims that he has Afri African ancestry could have been. at least not recently, this particular state public or uh, republic citizen is the United States Constitution was only identified as an English albino, albion, adult male at the inclusion of the Europe, of the English albion, adult woman, female at the United States of America is and always has been albion, English brotherhood entity and bastard child of his mother crown of England. All right. Now, I, I give some leeway in this because really, um, we showed you who was ruling Europe at that time period. It was the Brutish Moors in which that King George III and his wife, Queen Sophia Charlotte, were actually part of, called the Yorkshire Moors. The Moors was running England at this time, all right? So right here, Huckabee claims black people aren't technically citizens during critique of unjust laws. Well, that because it goes back to what we just finished talking about. This is what Huckabee. Now, Huckabee, if you don't know, he ran for president several times over the last 20 years. Okay. And he says black people aren't technically citizens. And that's right. <laughs> Not as long as we are clinging to names such as black, Negro, and colored. NBCs, black still not seen as American citizens, refugees in America, <laughs> MS, NBC, oh, there it is, NBC, Negro, Blacks, and Colors. <laughs> the missing NBCs, okay, there it is. So, so the ultimate ownership of all property is in the state. Individuals' so-called ownership is only by virtue of the government, i.e. law, amounting to mere user. In other words, you are a tenant. This is according to the Senate Resolution Number 62, paragraph 9, page 9, paragraph 2, April 17, 1933. So this is how it co correlates to the House Joint Resolution 192. They're correlated to the fact of Franklin Delano Roosevelt stated in 1933 of the New Deal. This is the New Deal. This is part of the New Deal, that the ultimate ownership of all property is in the state. Individual so-called ownership is only by virtue of the government, i.e., law amounting to mere user, tenants, and use must be in accordance with law. And 
subordinates to the necessities of the state. In other words, this is where you have to get your land meets and bounds, right? By meets and bounds, acreage, and they can come in and the zoning of the local committee of what is known actually the the city ordinance and zoning department, you have to go through them, right? Because they are the ones who will protect this 1933 law. And if you don't um, hold up to your end of what you're trying to do and what you're trying to put on your property, right? If you if you're trying to put something on your prop your property, you can't do it unless they verified and signed off on it. This is what this is all about. Land, in the most general sense, comprehends any ground, soil, or earth whatsoever as metals, pastures, woods, moors. The word moors is interchangeable with land, meaning moors and land are one and the same. According to our great scholar, Dr. John Henry Clark, he stated that your nationality must instantaneously tie you back to land, culture, and history. Instantaneously. There's no other word in the definition of land that ties us, which we use the word Moors, as our ethnicity, our, as part of our nationality, that ties us back to land. We're not woods. We're not waters. Even though we are three-fourths waters and more, we're not pastures. We're not meadows, marshes, firs, heath. We're moors. So, therefore, it says the word land includes not only the soil, but Everything attached to it, whether attached by course of nature as trees, herbage, and water. So the word moors includes land and water. Oh, hence when you anchor your boat to the shore or to the or to the coast or or the uh, pier near the pier, you are mowing your ship. You're mooring your ship. You are connecting the land and the water. Prophet Noble Jali foot is coming out of the water. Right? His left his his uh, right foot is coming out the water, right? Left foot is on the land and he's carrying woman, humanity. Because it's about uplift and fall of humanity. And he's there to carry us. Showing that He's anchored in the water and the land, tying it back that we are symbolic, the land, we are the Moors. Moorish Americans, or as we say, American or Mexican, Washita Moors. Part of parcel definition, meaning Collins. English dictionary, part and parcel phrase. If you say that something is part and parcel or something else, you are emphasizing that it is involved or included in it. So when you say you're part and parcel, we're saying that we're more, which is land and water. Simple. Two places where you'll see the word forever, the Lord's Prayer and on American land patterns. <laughs> If you look up the etymology of the word Lord, it states lover, lord, for O English, halof, or for, or left for, master of a household, ruler, feudal lord, superior. Pretty clear origin. Now related to the millions of acres owned by black Americans or better yet, not by black Americans, but by Moorish Americans, and it becomes pretty clear what God, um, who the gods are. Below us, a few steps to get you started on securing your family's, um, your family's patterns.
Okay? Talk to your relatives, number one. The elders in your family are more knowledgeable than you give them credit for. Talk to them. Get names from the early 1900s, 1800s, 1700s if possible. Collect names, stories, and even rumors. Start a paper trail. You will have to tie yourself to the patent holder in order to have title redeed. Redeed it. Hmm. How you do that? Well, you do that through a land pattern. You call the Bureau of Land Management. Hold on, let's let's look at this right quick. Eh? So, all right. So here we have an individual by the name of David Barnhart. All right, this is him here to the right. This is Secretary. David Barnhart, he's the 53rd Secretary of the United Department of Interior. The United States Department of Interior. All right. Uh, if you go ahead to bureau and offices, what do you see? What are the bureaus in which that he's over? Oh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The Bureau of Indian Education. Oh, the Bureau of Land Management. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. And once again, he's over the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Bureau of Indian Education, the Bureau of Land Management. We're just going to deal with these particularly, and specifically the Bureau of Land Management. All right, Lynn? Are you showing a picture of that right now? Yes. I don't think it's something. What you see? I see two places you'll see the word forever. Let's pray. Okay, so you can just follow me and go to Department of Interior then in your um um onto your computer. Go to Department of um United States Department of the Interior. Okay. The Bureau of Land Management in the search, site search. Once you get there, then you're going to be able to come down and look at the Bureau of Land Management. All right. In the Bureau of Land Management, and which is part of the United States Department of Interior, these are the individuals in which that you will have to deal with. And I don't know why it's not pulling up because I know I specifically wanted to share. Now, let me let me see if I can. All right, here we go. Now you should be able to see my screen. Can everybody see it? All right, so once again, we're going to go back. Yeah. This, is, this is the United States Department of Interior. This individual here to the right is Secretary David Barnhart. He's the 53rd Secretary of the United States Department of Interior. He's confirmed April the 11th, 2019, so just last year. All right. We go to Bureau and Offices. Under Bureaus, you see Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Indian Education, Bureau of Land Management. The ones that we're going to specifically deal with is the Bureau of Indian Affairs and specifically Bureau of Land Management. All right. We click on to Bureau of Land Management. All right. Now, if you want to find their services, you go to the word services. You can come down to forms. Land records, all right, 
forms and land records. Right? This is who you would send a copy that you would want to get a certified sealed copy of the land patent for your family's land for you to find out whose name is on it. It's about $25 for a certification, but you need the certified copy from the Bureau of Land Management of your state or of your region. Okay. Here it is, you can contact us, and as you go to states, go to states, as you see here, you contact us, national office, Alaska, Arizona, California, Colorado, Eastern states, Iowa, uh, or Idaho, excuse me, uh, Montana, Dakotas, Nevada, New Mexico, Oregon, Washington, Utah, Wyoming, All right, so we go to eastern states, since I'm on the east coast, I'll go here. Go to eastern state district offices. These the southern of uh, the southeastern office, since I'm in the southeast, this is where I would um, ask for information concerning land property here in the southeastern region. If I was in the northeast, then it would be here. If I was in the eastern state, it would be here. All right. So since I'm in the southeastern, we will see a part here. All right, so land records. This is what we want. Land records. The BLM, right, and not Black Lives Matter, y'all. This is the other BLM, okay? <laughs> This is the this is the ploy. BLM becomes Black Lives Matter. Overstanding that, it's talking about the Bureau of Land Management. <laughs> the BLM General Land Office Records website provides online access to federal land conveyance records for the public land states, which are states that were created out of the do public domain. The Website offers access to images of more than 5 million federal land title records issued since 1820. The site also has images related to um, survey plots, um, plats, and field notes dating back to 1810. Here it is. Check out GLO Record website. Well, let's go to the record website. Bam. All right, here we go. The official federal land record site. Welcome to the Bureau of Land Management General Land Office Record Automation website. We provide live access to federal land conveyance records for the public land states, including images or image access to more than 5 million federal land title records issued during 1788 and present. We also have images of survey plats and field notes, land status records, and control document index records. Due to organizations of documents in the GLO collection, this site does not currently contain every federal land record issue for the public land states. So, you see right here, 
land patterns. Uh oh, you can click onto the land patterns. And it says federal land patterns offers researchers a source of information on the initial transfers, transfer of land titles from the federal government to individuals. In addition to verifying title transfer, this information will also allow the researchers to associate an individual, patentee, assignee, warranty, widow, or heir. Remember, aired land can't be sold. I'm going to say that again. Aired land cannot be sold. One more time. Aired land cannot be sold. With a specific location, legal land description, and time issue date, we have a variety of land patterns on our site, including cash entry, homestead, and military warrant patterns. Hmm. Okay, here you go. United States Department of Bureau of, um, of Interior, Bureau of Land Management, General Land Office Records. There you go. Search, document by type. You can go in location, the state, the county, name, first, last name, first name, middle name, or you can go to search, document by location, land description, search, or search documents by identifier, series pattern, blah, 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 so forth and so on. So this is how you get to the page on which that we're on, which is the most important page for you to do your own research concerning your family's heritage, your family's land rights, your family land patterns. And then once you have your family's land patterns down pat, then you will secure a land patent claim. How do you take the steps to secure a land patent claim? Well, let's look at it. To prevent someone from evicting you off from the land you thought you owned, you need to create documents to declare and secure your land patent. The following instructions are the steps to create the land patent claim. We do not give advice, blah, blah, blah. However, let's get to it. All right? You must, number one, you must have a true right to the land, i.e., warranty deed, as opposed to uh, well supported quick claim deed, documented assignment, inheritance, et cetera, et cetera. So we just showed you how to get information concerning your family's land ties. Number two, find the land description of your right to the land, get it in to land pattern format on format. Land description of land patterns are almost all recorded in section, township, and range format, which is called STRF. If the land legal description of your land on your right to the land document here and hereafter warranty deed is not in STRF, then you need to get it into a format, the format for your land patent claim documents. To do that, you need to trace the legal description of your warranty deed back to STRF. For example, if your deed say lot three of the Burner Tur, the Burton subdivision and record of the Dexter County land records, then you um, go to uh, the Dexter County Clerk and Register or Recorder's Office, as is also recorded, Register of Deeds, Recorder's Office, um, and find the subdivision plat map. Find your lot and locate the section, town, and region or range, and it includes your lot. Get a copy of the county plat map of the subdivision your land is located in. 
You especially need the part that legally describes the land. The part that part is called the legal and is almost always listed in the land description in STRF. When you're there, it won't hurt to get a couple of certified copies of your warranty deed for their records. Three, with the description of your land in STRF, you're ready to get acquired a copy, to go acquire a copy of the appropriate land pattern for your land. Here it is. This is done by taking the legal description of your land in STRF to the Bureau of Land Management, to the Bureau of Land Management, to the Bureau of Land Management, Mint, Mint, and ask them, asking them in their land pattern record office for a certified 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 copy of the land pattern for the land presented by land description included section township and range is a good idea to get at least two certified copies two certified copies of the appropriate pattern and a copy of the pattern plat map for the particular township your land is in Four, now that you have certified copies of your land pattern and certified copies and all originals of your warranty deed, you're ready to prepare two very important documents to complete your pattern claim. The new document as the warranty or quick claim deed, as it is called here, and the declaration of land pattern. So there's two. The new documents are the quick claim deed or quite claim deed and the declaration of land pattern. The quite claim deed and the declaration of land pattern. When the when those documents are finished, you'll be ready to compile your completed land pattern claim in the form of which we call the land pattern sandwich. All right? The land pattern sandwich is a single document compiled of several documents listed top to bottom. On top, the quiet claim deed, your right to the land, i.e. warranty deed, grant deed, quiet claim deed, etc. A, the document will not be a trustee. If you have a trustee, you'll decide to follow these instructions. You may be aware um, for additional help, you can call that number or, as we would say, give us a call right here. If this document is a quiet claim deed or quick claim deed, you'll need to place the underlying authority, warranty deed, that passes the authority of the land to you under your quiet claim deed. The declaration of land pattern, the land pattern itself goes on the bottom. The bottom to top order is very important. So start on a empty table and set the land pattern down on the bottom of what will be the land pattern sandwich, become the land pattern sandwich. Next comes declaration of land pattern, which needs some preparation work done before, um, first. So move on to the next step. Take one of the forms, declaration of land pattern, Complete it as follow. First, generate the proper land pattern, uh, legal land description for your land by merging any lot subdivision description of the section township and range description from the county plat map of your subdivision and enter the properly merged land description into the space provided for it on the Declaration of land pattern, all right? Next, complete the remainder of the declaration of land pattern by filling in the blanks from the top, all right? Fill in your name as the person requesting the re recording. Use proper name format. In other words, your indigenous appellation. 
file in, fill in your name in the name and address, temporary mailing location, brackets around the zip code, space fill in your mailing address, fill in your city, state, and post office zip code in the blanks, fill in the pattern number in the space provided on the first line after that, fill in your name and you may cross out the appropriate personal pronoun for I, we, and you know, the S if necessary, the proper merge land description, legal land description shall already be entered from the previous instruction. Do this step later after you have compiled your land patent sandwich, go to a notary public, fill out the remainder of the documents there, just file on fill in the blanks as suggested on the guided page. All right, next place your land patent, um, document of land patent on top of the certified land patent um, as part of the land patent sandwich, place your warranty deed on top of the finished copyright declaration of land patent as part of the land patent sandwich, take one of the forms of the um, quiet, um, quick claim deed and complete it as it follows. First, place the land description you generate from the land patent into the space provided for, um, for it on the quiet claim deed. Um, next, complete the remainder of the quick claim deed by filing, filling in the blanks for the top. Fill in your name um, as the person requesting recording. Fill in the name of the space just below. Fill in your mailing location, city, state, post office zip code blanks, fill in your name in the second line of the deed after I, we, and again in the fifth um, line after and forever quick claim two, you may cross out the inappropriate person, um, personal pronoun from I, we if necessary. For your copy, certified copy of your land patent, find the name of the person to whom it was originally issued and entered the person's name after as a signee of on the third line. Fill in the patent number in the space provided after number on line three. Fill in the county <coughs> and state name on line on nine line. The proper merge legal land description should always already be entered for the previous instruction all right so we have all of this and i'll um show you um how it looks but right here understand the sandwich of how it works on the top of the sandwich you have the highest authority of the land title the certified copy of your land of your um land pattern in other words that um, declared that the land belongs Free sim fee simple to the party named on the patent and to their heirs and the signs forever, 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 ever. The patent is yours by right of assignment or inheritance. So the next document is your declaration of land patent. Your right to claim the land by declaration is your assignment of the land, which assignment is found within your warranty deed where the deed say grant and or assign. Therefore, a certified copy of your warranty deed is the third document on the pile. The top document is your quiet claim deed, which moves your land out of equity, which is fairness to the contract, into the law fact and fee simple. This quick claim a quite claim deed is likely the most important part of the entire sandwich. It completes the move out of the statutory and contract control into the law of the land. The land patent sandwich is one inseparable document. Staple a copy of the land patent sandwich together and you're done. Make two copies is, um, is better, one for filing and the other keep secure for yourself. Go to the notary public. Um, with the both copies and complete the signatures and dates, etc. You need not publicly file any record of your land patent. However, most people prefer to protect themselves with, file, with public filing. There are several methods of filing on public filing you may use. They are as follow. File it with the clerk 
and recorder's office with the land records of the county. Two, make public notice that you brought the pattern up in your name in a legal notice in a local newspaper. All right? Post the land pattern sandwich on the county's public notice bulletin board, usually found in either the county district courthouse or the sheriff's office, or both. All right? Post office bulletin board while uh, would be significant. Right? Even the post office bulletin board would be significant. As stated before in this instruction, once a land pattern is the operating authority on the land, the land cannot be taken for debt or taxes. For this reason, some people don't want the record um, to record the pattern in the county records. No one can lawfully seize patent land to secure a debt. They are concerned that anyone wanting to obtain a loan wouldn't be able to file or find a bank that will loan them money. Others uh, want to file the patent in the county records because they are going to be fighting off a foreclosure or tax seizure and they want the solid public record. All right, so Let's look at what is a land pattern. As we say, essentially a land pattern is the first conveyance of title ownership to land which the United States government grants a citizen who applies for one. How do you apply for one? Through the Bureau of Land Management, the United States Department of Interior. In particular, this section right here that we just went over. I don't know why it's taking some time for this thing to pull up. Come on, come on. There we go. All right. So you can get your information put in right here, the state, the county, blah, blah, blah. You find your family land, your land can't be sold, so you can go back and capture it by way of a land pattern, which is superior to a deed. It's superior to a warranty deed. It's superior to a court claim deed. It is superior. All right, so let's look at the land pattern itself and the, the description in which that we were just talking about actually is the land pattern and how it will look. This is um, correlated to, let me make it bigger here. All right, declaration of land pattern. All right, procedure. Um, what we talk about, we're going to come on down and you can actually see uh, how it looks at the bottom here. All right, so land pattern was legal description for 60 days. When not challenged by anyone, the land pattern was then granted. An alternative way to give the other party notice is to publish a notice of declaration of land pattern in a legal publication in your county of residence. All right? This is what we've just talking about. So notice, all right, notice is something in which that must be given. All right, we got to give notice. All right, 60 days. They don't come forth, then uh, it's yours. It is stand as truth. Remember, truth must be expressed in the form of an affidavit. So your truth has been expressed in this form of this declaration. And therefore, it stands as truth. All right? So let's look at it. Land patterns, ejectments, and estoppel. In case of ejectment, with the question 
is who has legal title. The pattern of the government is unassailable. Sanford versus Sanford. All right. You can't come against a land pattern. This is what this is just talking about. The transfer of legal title patent to public domain give the transferee the right to possess and enjoy the land transferred. Gibson versus Chadal, 80 U.S. 92. Three, a patent for land is the highest evidence of title and is conclusive as against the government in all claiming under junior patents or titles. United States versus Stone. 2 U.S. 525. The presumption brings that the patent is valid and passes the legal title. All right. Minster versus Primalin, 18 U.S. 87. Estoppel has been sustained as against a municipal corporation, county. All right. Beetle versus Bindle versus. Um, Schmeiser, um, 209. A court of law will not uphold or enforce an equitable title to land as a defense to an action of ejectment. All right. Johnson versus Christian, 128 U.S. 374. When Congress has described the conditions upon which portions of the public domain may be alienated to convey to transfer and has provided the above the fulfillment of the conditions of the United States shall issue a patent to the purchaser. Then such land is not taxable by a state. Mm. Sergeant versus Herrick and Stevens, 221 U.S. 404. Northern PR County versus Trail County, 11. 5 U.S. 600. The patent alone passes land from the United States to the grantee, and nothing passes a perfect title to public land but a patent. Wilcox versus Jackson, 13 Peter, U.S. 498. Patents and other evidence of title for the United States um, government are not controlled by state recording law and shall be effective as against consequent purchaser only for the time of their record in the county. Lomax versus um, Pickerent Nets. Right, if federal courts, the patent is held to be the foundation of title at law, Finn versus Holmes. 21 Howard 481. So, as you see, land patents are superior. Congress has the sole power to declare the dignity and effect of title emanating from the United States and the whole legislation of the government in reference to the public law. Declare the patent to be the superior and conclusive evidence of legal tide. Until it issues, the fee is in the 183 governments to which the patent passed to the um, grantee, and he is entitled to enforce the possession in ejectment. So if you want to eject someone from off your land, you could. All right, this is essentially what the um, empress did when she said she wanted to have all colorless uh, uh, people removed from her land when she wrote that too. <laughs> All right, it didn't go down, but she wrote it. Um, it's in my book, and y'all can see it for those who have my book. Um, she wanted all colorless um people to be removed from the land. Um, up to sixty-eight thousand eight hundred eighty-three acres of land. In ejectment, the legal title must prevail and a patent of the United States to public lands pass that title. It cannot be assailed collaterally on the grounds that false and 
um, perjured testimony was used to secure it. Steel versus St. Louis Smelting and Refining Company, 106 U.S. 417. A patent certificate or patent issue or confirmation made to the original grantee or his legal representatives of the grantee and assignee by contract as well as by law. Um, Hogan versus Pat Space. 69 U.S. 605. All right. In federal court, the rules that ejectment cannot be maintained on a mere equitable title is strictly enforced. So the ejectment cannot be maintained on a mere entry made with a register and receiver, but only on the patent. Since the certificates of the Office of the Land Department invested in the loc um, locator, um, locator only equitable title. This rule prevails in the federal court, even when the statute of the state in which the suit is being provided, that a receipt from the local land office is significant proof of title to support the action. Langdon versus Sherwood. All right. So, we can see on and on and on the right to the ownership of property to contract with respect to its use is unalienable or unalienable. All right. Um, property value means the price the property will command in the market or is equivalent in lawful money. The state must provide for a collection of taxes in gold, silver only. This is called State Treasurer versus Right, 28 Illinois 509. So we see over and over again how this is. So land patterns issued by the Bureau of Land Management, Department of Interior of the United States um, State Government is the highest and best title of law. The holder of the declaration of the land patent as a sign is the absolute owner of the property as described on that patent. No court in the United States can change a declaration of land patent without the express permission of the holder of that patent. A declaration of land patent being the highest title of law is superior to any other type of deed, including that in what? A warranty deed, sheriff deed. A quiet claim deed, which actually a quiet claim deed actually is, is part of, as we said earlier, but even then, if it was by itself, it would still be superior. Once a declaration of land patent is in place and duly recorded, it cannot be removed. And therefore, you are removed from the tax ass um, uh, assessment administration role. Everybody understand what we just said? The only authority responsible for the, um, to be the holder of the Declaration of Land patent is the United States government. A patent cannot be violated or transferred without the permission of the assigned. Enforcement of a patent must come from the United States government. So this Chief, are you still speaking?
Peace, peace. Anybody still there? Peace, I'm still here. I can't hear Chief Aline. Uh, peace. Uh, peace, Aline. I don't know where he was. Huh. I wanted to do something. I came right back. And everything was silent. Anybody else here? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still here. Fahim. No, I'm not. I can't no, hear Ali. But he's switching pages like a mug, though. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, no. He went, oh, he went silent, man. No, yeah, he went silent. But he, he, he flicking through his, uh, uh, his, 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 uh, his pictures. He probably don't know he's silent. And maybe looking for some.
I just um text Kadira. She gonna tell him to fix it. Hey, thank you much, sister. <laughs>